uh, really good to see everybody out this morning. And uh, if you're watching at home um, and you're physically able, we would love to see you. Um, it's weather's getting nicer, and, and we promise we don't bite. So you can join us, and uh, as Dave said, you can fellowship with us. So we would really love to see you, but it is good to see everyone here this morning, and I see our numbers are slowly increasing, which is, is a good, good thing. Um, Dave and I did not coordinate on this, um, on his communion talk, when he talked about the covenant that uh, God made with us through his son, and, and it just so happens that we're going to look at the covenant that God made with Abraham and then Jesus, And but it's, it's one of those things that when you're reading from the same book, you get the same information. And we don't have all this external stuff out there trying to filter into God's word. And so what Dave said, thanks for the, the preamble, Dave. When God called Abraham, oh, by the way, Cheryl said I had to make this brief because she's hungry, so uh, <laughs> I'm gonna rush right through this. So let's just skip to the closing song. <laughs> when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, he made some promises to him. You know, and to be fair, we can't blame Abraham if he's somewhat dubious about all this, being called by an invisible God, because after all, he came from a polytheistic uh, culture where idols are worshipped as part of their daily life. And Abraham would have had household idols. He would have had his personal idols that he worshipped growing up. And this is referenced in Joshua uh, chapter 24, verses 15. So when God calls him and tells him to leave everything that he's known his entire life, and he'll be shown a land that he and his descendants will inherit, I think we can appreciate his apprehension with all this. Remember, he can't see God. He only hears a voice. And unlike the handmade gods that he used worshiping, God is a spirit. Our God is a spirit, John 4, 24. Ur was at the time perhaps the most advanced and prosperous society of its day. Some have called it the cradle of civilization. <laughs> Abraham probably had a pretty comfortable life. So guided by faith, he leaves Ur as instructed by this invisible God and following this new God, Scripture tells us that by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Hebrews 11:8. In Genesis chapter 15, God begins to lay the groundwork for the covenant that he'll eventually make with Abraham. Except this time, instead of God just speaking to Abraham, he reassures his promise with the visual of his presence. God instructs Abraham to kill a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old ram, a three-year-old goat, a dove, and a pigeon. You notice that God is very specific about the age of the animals. Now, apparently, God is a stickler for details. And this will become more evident as we look at the specifics of the covenant that God makes with Abraham. God then instructs Abraham to cut them in half, except for the birds. One sec. And lay the pieces in two rows, leaving a path in the center of the animals. Genesis 15, 9-10. In the ancient Near East, this type of ritual was done to seal the promise that was made. The parties involved, this was the blood covenant. God confirming three promises he made to Abraham. One, the promise of heirs. Now remember, Abraham is old. He didn't have any children. didn't have any prospects of children. Number two, that he would inherit land. And number three, of the future of blessings unseen. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. The parties involved would then walk the path to the slaughtered animals as if to say, may this be done to me if I do not keep my oath. 
blood covenant such as this is called a self malediction oath and malediction simply means I will bring a curse upon myself if I violate this pledge but there was an important difference in this blood oath that God made with Abraham when the evening came God appeared to him in the form of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch that passed between the pieces of the animals Genesis 15 7 and the scripture tells us that Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him verse 12 now this is crucial and what makes this covenant unique is that God alone passed through the pieces of the dead animals and the covenant was sealed by God alone nothing depended on Abraham everything depended on God who promised to be faithful to his covenant. Hebrews chapter 6, 13 through 18 says, When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. The Old Testament biblical scholar Dr. Michael Heiser puts it this way, Only God could fulfill the covenant that he made with man, because only God would never fail because man would continue to fail. Even though there were times of outright disobedience and rebellion from the children of Israel, Abraham and his descendants would ultimately know that they could trust God and count on him and believe everything that he had pledged to them. A covenant is between two or more parties where the parties pledge to do something. A covenant defines a relationship by setting the terms of that relationship. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 14, this is exactly what God does. God sets the terms of the covenant he'll make with Abraham. And we'll look at those terms shortly. Now you might be thinking, what's the difference between a covenant and a contract? I did. I thought they were the same thing, just a different name. So I did some research and found that contracts and covenants are similar, but they're not the same thing. And here are some fundamental differences. And these differences are important in understanding biblical covenants. While a contract is legally binding, a covenant in the biblical sense is a spiritual agreement. In this, trade, in this case between God and Abraham, but eventually between God and us, through Jesus. And it's through Jesus that we make the spiritual agreement, our covenant with God. A contract is an arrangement between parties, while a covenant is a pledge. A pledge is an oath based upon your sacred honor. Remember, this is, this is a, a sacred honor, shame society. Your word, your oath, your bond, it meant everything. A contract is an agreement you can break, while a covenant, remember this, is perpetual. It's a perpetual promise. Remember, Jesus said, Lo, I will be with you always, Matthew 28, 20. Not just sometimes or when things are looking good, but always. You seal a covenant, in this case with blood. A contract is mutually, mutually beneficial, while a covenant is something you fulfill as an individual. Here again is that honor aspect. An exchange, a contract exchanges one good for another, while a covenant is giving oneself to the other. God gave himself as a pledge. Let's not forget the covenant Jesus made that he would selflessly give himself for us. Another important difference is that under certain circumstances, you can opt out of a contract if someone fails to uphold their part of the contract. While a covenant is about having the strength, the moral conviction, the honor, and the integrity to uphold your part of the covenant. And again, this is based on your honor. Here we see that God swears by himself to Abraham, his honor. One can stop paying a contract when one party is not fulfilling their part of a deal. However, in a covenant, the party not getting their needs met supports the failing party so that they can meet their obligation. If we fail 
to meet our part of the covenant, covenant we made with God, he is still fulfilling his part. Jesus is still there. God just doesn't throw up his spiritual hands and walk away in a hug. I'm Amen. done with you. Amen. And when we have fallen, as Israel did many, many times, God is willing to take us back into that covenantal relationship. Overall, a covenant is a better way to build relationships, both in business and in private. Covenants are a trust-based promise that you relies on your integrity and your honor and your discipline. While contracts are enforceable by the courts, covenants depend on our values, our integrity, our honor. And we see a constant theme throughout this. Honor, integrity, values, and the shame we bear if we fail to uphold our sacred oath. Brandy's going to put an overhead on the screen, and there it is. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 14, Moses writes, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face, and God walked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, which, by the way, means exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be, God, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of the sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, and you shall you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me, you, and your descendants. <coughs> after you, every male, you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you, who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in your house, in the house, or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants, a servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall be surely circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now I'd like to break these passages down for you. Notice how God refers himself here. I, nine times. My, seven times. Me, five times. Me, myself, and I, 21 times in 14 verses. Me, myself, and I indicates ownership. God refers to his covenant 10 times in 11 verses. This is God's covenant, his requirements. And God commands Abraham, you shall do something 11 times. God's not asking. He's commanding Abraham. Notice here again what God says in verse 14, but an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. In other words, he has disobeyed my requirements to be part of my covenant. God is saying, we aren't negotiating here, Abraham. This isn't a theological buffet. You can't pick and choose what parts of this covenant you want to obey. I've said this before. In God's eyes, partial obedience is still disobedience. 
Remember the story of Saul? He partially obeyed God's command to completely uh, destroy the Amalekites, 1 Samuel 15, 3. And what happened to him? God removed the kingdom from him. And God didn't take the requirement to be circumcised lightly. In fact, this aspect of the covenant was so important that after the generations of Israelites who died wandering in the wilderness, that in Joshua chapter 5, we read where God instructed <coughs> Joshua to circumcise all the males born in the wilderness during this period. Why? Because they hadn't been circumcised. They were not part of God's covenant. So how does God view his covenant with us? The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, 38 through 39, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. This is, of course, as long as we are faithful. God will still love us, and he will uphold his pledge, regardless if we leave that covenant. In 2 Timothy chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, Paul writes about Demas, who was once a faithful disciple of Christ and companion of Paul. And Paul writes, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Even though Demas left God and broke his covenant with God, we're reminded of the prodigal son and the parable Jesus tells us that God is always waiting for our return. This is the perpetual nature of the covenant we spoke about a few minutes ago. Even though Abraham had some serious issues trusting God during his journey, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans 4.3 the final ultimate blood covenant was made by Christ Jesus himself. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 through 38, and Luke 22, 20, as well as other passages of scripture, tell us that the new covenant was in Jesus' blood. And the shadows of the old covenant became realities in Christ, who fulfilled all of the Old Testament blood covenants with his own blood once and for always. In Hebrews chapter 10. This is where this is addressed. He sealed his new covenant with his blood, his blood oath, Hebrews chapter 8, 13. True and faithful disciples of Christ can be confident that the gift of eternal life that God gives through Christ Jesus is the true promise. It's the new covenant that God is making with us through his son, Jesus. As the Apostle Paul explains, the covenant was established with Abraham and his seed. Now notice Paul uses that word seed singular. Despite what the world would have you believe, there aren't multiple covenants or paths to God. Let me say that again for our friends who may be listening on the internet. There aren't multiple paths or ways to, to God. Jesus said, I am the truth Amen. and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. John 14, 6. And Paul interprets this as the singular person of Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, Paul writes, Therefore, all who are in Christ are spiritual heirs of the promise made to Abraham. <coughs> To put it simply, a blood covenant is a pledge made by God that he will choose a people for himself and bless them. Amen. The covenant that was originally for Abraham's physical descendants was later extended spiritually to all of those who, like Abraham, believe God. And Paul continues, Therefore, recognize that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, that's us, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all nations shall be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Galatians 3, 7. God's promise of eternal blessings are given only on the base, basis of faith in the saving blood. Jesus Christ, his son. Hebrews 9, 12. In a minute or so, Otis is going to lead us in an invitation song.
And as he does, I, I, I'd like you to think about, well, I'd like to think about all this, but think about this for a moment. The creator of the universe, the God of heaven, personally came to this earth and walked through the dirt and the dust and the blood of dead animals to seal his covenant, his pledge with Abraham. And some 2,000 years ago, as he had done with Abraham, God once again came to this earth in the form of his son, Jesus. He left his heavenly throne to have his own blood mingled with the dirt and the dust to seal his covenant with us. The Apostle Paul wrote that if, if we're in Jesus through baptism, then we're a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and an heir to his covenant. Now, if you're in the audience this morning and you're not in Christ through baptism, then you're like the people that we read about in the Old Testament who hadn't been circumcised to fulfill God's covenant and his requirements. And therefore, you're outside that covenant. And sadly, just as they were cut off from God, unless you are in Christ, you too are outside of the covenant relationship with God. The Apostle Paul reminds us that today, March 6th, 2022, is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6.2. And I'll leave you with this <clears throat> for your consideration. James, the brother of Jesus, warns us of the temporary nature of this life. He says, come now, you say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. James 4, 13 or 14. Everyone in this audience who has been baptized for the remission of your sins is praying for you, is thinking about you if you're here or if you're watching at home and you're not a member of the church. There is no other way to God. There is no other way to be in his covenant relationship unless you go through Jesus. Amen. And if you happen to be here today and you're not in that covenant relationship, we can make that happen today. Or if you are watching at home and you'd like further information about what do I need to do to become a Christian, a child of God, a disciple of Christ, let us know because we can make that happen for you. So as Otis prepares to lead us in this invitation him. As we stand and sing, think about these things, meditate on these things.